be talking about today is going to be when, uh, you know, in the previous presentation we had been mentioning things such as the firewall and protections for students and how students use technology. What I will be discussing will be some of the um, management systems that are used to make sure that those policies that are put into place um, are, are enforced. So we're going to be talking about MDM, which I'll be mentioning a lot. MDM is short for Mobile Device Management. And so we'll be talking about that and technology, security, and schools. So just to introduce myself real quick, I'm currently the, I'm, my name is Christine, and I'm currently the Instructional Assistant in Technology, um, and you know, our divisions are huge. I have, there's a running joke about me and long names for the places I work, you know, and Brenda knows this. Um, but I'm currently the, an IAT in the Division of Innovation and Instructional Support for Fullerton School District, and my previous, um, position as of a month ago was the technology assistant for Alliance College Ready Middle Academy number four. So with the timing of this particular uh, particular new position and having come from another position, I can deliver two perspectives from two different districts. Um, Alliance is a charter school organization, whereas Fullerton has been around since 1888. So uh, it's going to be a very interesting, um, very diverse uh, discussion here. So. A little bit about myself, I um, came from USC uh, with a degree in English, has absolutely nothing to do with whatever I work on now. So, and I was a teacher for LA Unified. I'm currently in my second semester here in the E-Tech program at, at uh, Cal State Long Beach. And uh, I've also done desktop hardware support at university level, I've done it independently. So I've seen things that go blink and both in school and in, uh, and in the professional world. So that's what I've done. So one of, the, um, one of the things, and I'm basing this on the uh, um, learning objectives from last semester, uh, it was to integrate technology and lessons and classroom activities and facilitate an effective teaching and learning process. So that's where the mobile device management comes in. Um, so these are some current trends. And if you get into student teaching when you, or if you observe or you currently work in a school, you've probably seen at least three, one of these three most typical, very common uh, setups for schools and technology. So one of the most common is the one-to-one -one Chromebook or iPad model, or both, as mentioned in the previous presentation. Um, Long Beach Unified is a split between Chromebooks and iPads. At Alliance, we were a split between Chromebooks and iPads. At Fullerton, it is completely Apple devices, full iPad. So there are ways that these, the Chromebook and iPad one-to-one mo uh, uh, -one model is used. You can, it's individually assigned devices, and they would check, either they would check them out during the day or they would be holding onto them 24-7. So there's a little bit of, it, depending on the, on the procedures and the policies that the district has set up, it's going to differ. Another option is a Chromebook or iPad class set in which students do not own the device. It is a cart that, is, that stays in a classroom. So that is another option I've seen. And, uh, and depending on the setup, you know, could be effective. And the other option is the loaner cart, the traveling cart, the cart that lives in the library, the, the one cart that three classes will fight over to use 10 a.m. on a Tuesday. That has happened too. There are districts that still use that. It just depends on the district. Um, other things that are also good trend, uh, there are trends that are very popular. And these are in both sites that I used to work at that I work at or used to work at, G Suite integration. Google, Google's integration in regards to um, logins has been adopted by many districts. Um, the Alliance and Fullerton both use G Suite very actively. And uh, one of the nice things is, um, and how many of you guys uh, are familiar with uh, a student information system like PowerSchool maybe? Yeah, use PowerSchool. It's a student information system. It's the databases for all of the for all student records. Well, it's really nice because, you know, a student comes into the school, boom, let's issue them a username and password, call it a day. And Google would be your universal login. Uh, really beneficial because ease of accounts, you know, just goes into effect. You set up your Google account, you get your Gmail, you get all of your docs, you get your Google Drive. And because it's education, Google Drive has unlimited storage, which is very, very useful, especially when you have, you know, a student going through your entire district, you know, through multiple years, 
and saying, oh, yeah, I still have my stuff from sixth grade, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm a senior now. You know? So it's, it's good to have, and also because all of that can be exported out before the student graduates, all of that data can be transferred onto something else, and they can move on to keep it on the cloud. Uh, but one of the beautiful things, too, is that G Suite is cloud-based. It doesn't rely on a certain operating system. You could have an iPad. You could have a Chromebook. You could have Linux. You could have Windows. You could have OS X. It doesn't matter what you have because it's all cloud-based and online. Everything will read it. And also, it is cross-compatible with current products like Microsoft. So, you know, PowerPoint presentation or a Word document or an Excel sheet, it's all, it's all universal. And the nice thing too is with, with Google is that there are settings within Google, administrative settings, that they can be set depending on the needs of the school or students or a certain situation that comes up. As, as in previous presentation, you know, how do we react to issues that come up in regards to security, in regards to uh, something a student discovers or what a student decides to do with a certain product there are ways to adjust and adapt to it. So managing usage of technology in the classroom. First off, when it comes to technology, you know all the tricks that kids will do. They'll hide the screen away from you. Mm -hmm. you know, they'll close the lid as, what, as you're walking by. Oh, what are some other ones? Oh, that, that one about altering the grades to make it look like you know, the, old, the old HTML preloaded you know, alteration trick, yeah, I've seen that in my own school, and this was a sixth grader doing it. Yeah. Oh, if, if, if you can think it or not think it, it's probably been done. And so, you know, as mentioned, you know, children really like to play with shiny objects. You know? And screens make it, you know, it's, it's easy. And so the traditional classroom practices that could be done with pencil paper, integrity folders, you know, those kind of things, can't do it anymore. You need help. And that's where the mobile device management comes in. And these, this software aids teachers. They have a, a um, control panel in front of them. They can see what students are doing. I'll actually show you screenshots of uh, one, of the, one of the ones that's used at my old site called GoGuardian that's used on Chromebooks. And uh, GoGuardian is, uh, is one that uh, you can lock screens and all sorts of fun things. I had a frame. <laughs> no, you're fine. OK. So, um, and it's really huge, uh, web-based mobile device management applies to Chromebooks, it applies to iPads, anything that students will walk around with or use in classroom. So some of the mobile device management software examples, you'll see these names. Um, uh, for Chromebook, Go Guardian is the one that um, I have the most familiarity with because that was used with uh, a, a district with over, well, almost 13,000 students in it and uh, almost a one-to-one -one I would say about 75% of that district at that charter school organization was using Chromebook. Um, Omnito, Neetop Vision, and Impero are very close to that too. Not too much knowledge about that just because um, GoGuardian is, was my big choice. But once you learn one, you, you, you see lots of uh, similarities. Um, for iPad and iOS devices, Apple Classroom, Apple does have their own. Uh, it's really more of a classroom based, not complete like district level, but it can be used within a classroom for management. Lightspeed and Jeff Pro are the two that are used to, um, to manage whole district and to manage thousands and thousands of devices at once. Um, Impero and Mythware um, are two others that are also competitors and are other options that some districts have considered at one point. So I'm going to go through the technology profiles for the two sites that I'm at. Well. The, two, the, the site that I was at previously a month ago and the sites that I'm at now. So the first one that I'll be talking about will be my previous site, Alliance College Ready Middle Academy Number 4. It is a part of the Alliance College Ready Public Schools charter organization. And it was a middle school of 455 students between the grades of 6 to 8. So this is, about, this is a middle school of 455. Um, and it, it ran a concurrent one-to-one -one iPad and one-to-one -one Chromebook program. Uh, at, so one-to-one -one iPad was piloted as an optional take-home program. What had happened was is that the iPads, when they got older, we acquired Chromebooks the following semester. And so with these iPads going, what do we do with all these? Now we have a two-to-one ratio. What's going on? Or a one-to-two ratio. 
well, let's, uh, let's do an experiment and say, hey, we have, and this is, this is South LA, this is the 110 and 105 freeway, very low socioeconomic area, where students do not have, a lot of students do not have um, you know, complete access to technology at all times. And so we piloted this program, and, and uh, about 200 students originally participated in the program. We considered it mildly successful, but there was one issue that we did come across when, this, when we reassessed it and why it only lasted one semester. Lack of Wi-Fi access at home. So that killed the program because it turned out that even with a parents having cell phones, they were probably on limited data plans. So using them as a hotspot would have been, especially for like YouTube access, you know, that uses a lot of bandwidth after a while. Or any sort of um, prolonged internet access would eat up a data plan. So that was one of the biggest things that led to that. And, and when I mentioned the whole socioeconomic area thing, as soon as I say low, you know, lack of, there's going to be a lot of that when we're, when we're comparing two schools, two school systems against each other or with each other. Um, so what I did the following semester is many of those iPads um, are, had stayed in reserve. I ended up just taking 120 of these iPads and turning them into four class cards that could be you know, borrowed and, for you, and used for other particular special projects like I need a camera so that we can do a short film on iMovie or we need to go record something or I need to, or I need to use a certain app that's not available on a Chromebook but we can do it on the iPad. So the, the iPads kind of took us a, a seat back but at the same time we used as backup devices so that students would never be without something. So if Chromebook went down at the minimum, if I could not issue a student a Chromebook, I would be able to give them something else that they would still be able to complete work with. So it was really, a, really the strategy for this particular area was, let's make sure that they are able to complete what they are given with whatever we have. So that's, that's really what we came to that. So the one-to-one -one Chromebooks that came later was truly a one-to-one, -one and they were all split up by advisory classes. So every, every morning, student would come in, check out a certain Chromebook assigned to them by serial number, use the Chromebook, and at the end of the day before leaving, they would turn it in, and we would clear the entire school, make sure that no units were missing, and then we would dismiss. And that was, that was the structured system that was at this school. This happened day to day, every single day, to make sure, because theft was a big issue, and including, you know, instead mentioning the area that I was in, you know, it was a very high crime area, so I wanted to make sure that nothing, we didn't lose our assets and that students wouldn't be taking equipment either accidentally or, or for whatever reason. So, uh, and uh, in addition to that, there was a loaner card in case a, a Chromebook went down. You know, we would say, hey, okay, here, borrow this, borrow this for the time being, and then we'll, we'll record it, and then you bring it back at the end of the day. So we always had backups. That was one, one, uh, um, Good mark about the time that I was there was that we always had something. There was always um, there was always a device. So primary management software we used was GoGuardian, which is uh, a combination mobile device management and a web filter. So from previous uh, presentation talking about whitelisting and blacklisting, this is what this is the this is the software that that did that. So all teachers had an account for classroom management, which you will see shortly, uh, screenshots of. And admin also had an account for the admin as in, every, as in like the principal, me as the technology assistant, or anyone else who was involved in tech, had the ability to, um, to see tracking um, log of student usage. For example, if a student is visiting a website that is flagged or, um, using a, or visiting a site that's um, you know, not, not appropriate for class, things like that, you know, that's there. And web filters can be bypassed as well. So, you know, we do have, for example, in a pinch, there's a certain website that can't be, you know, that needs to be accessed. But if I were to whitelist it, there would be like a three hour turnaround before all of the uh, Chromebooks would be allowed to use it. I said, okay, you need this right now. Here's a password I've set for you, because um, a, a bypass a bypass page will come up. And this, this bypass will last for 45 minutes, the duration of your class use this, and then after it's all over, then we can either keep that password to use, you know, for the teachers or delete it, depending on the need, so. 
So here's, a, here's an admin view of what you see if you're on GoGuardian. Depending on which MDM you're using, it's going to differ. But as you can see here, this is a, this is a screenshot of an entire school. So you can see like what top sites are being used. So right now, 57.9% using Google Docs because they're probably doing something in class involving writing an essay. It'll see you'll see a summary a summary of like how many users are online at any given time, how many flagged sites, how many times this website's been blocked and someone's tried attempted to uh, to bypass it by trying to put in some random password, and also what are some of the more popular sites that are being used by the school at any given time. And this can be broken down by classroom. This can be broken down by, by day, and so this is good for data if you need to figure out like what trends are going on during certain parts of, of the day or the month. So you get, you get to know everything. Um, cool things too is with GoGuardian, if this is, a, this is actually a, um, a screenshot of what a class would look like in a timeline view. You can actually see with individual students how long they spent on YouTube between here and here, how long they were on Facebook, what they were doing with a doc over here, um, some, uh, some random app or something on their Chromebook right there, how long they were on Wikipedia, and so this, this is one of the, uh, these are some things that you can use in tracking. One of the cool things about the teacher admin side is you have the ability to free screens. You have the ability to force view. For example, if you want everyone on google.com or you want everyone on a Wikipedia page, you don't have to tell people, okay, look at the page on the board, I need you to copy this URL exactly, because you know what they're going to do. They're not going to copy it. But instead, you force it on them and they can't, lock, they can't uh, deviate. Or here, you may have Chrome open, but you can only have one window open and we're taking a test. You can only have one tab open. So that means if you're taking an English test and you can't open up dictionary.com as your second tab. There's a lot of things that can be used to help manage the flow of classroom <coughs> management depending on you know, what you need. So that, that's Alliance. With uh, Fullerton, their, um, their uh, technology profile at Fullerton, they do something called the one-to-one -one visible I innovation program, VIP. And so, as mentioned with Long Beach Unified, it's very similar, they follow very similar um, goals coming in with the four C's and also increasing as, here we go, here's your four C's right there, collaboration, creativity, critical thinking, and communication. This is all from Fullerton's uh, website. And as part of the VIP, grades five through eight, because um, Fullerton is a TK to eighth grade a district made up of 20 schools. Fifth to eighth graders get to take it home every day. They have home internet access that they have to access through a special portal that, so that when they access the internet through their iPads, it is protected under the same filters that they have at school. So they are protected there. They can't just go willy-nilly and get on someone's, um, you know, get on uh, like, I don't know, Starbucks or something like that and try to get on something because it'll, their, their ability to go around the web portal is disabled. Is that a solution to the problem that you mentioned? Of, of students? Not having Wi-Fi at home? Um, well, Students not having Wi-Fi at home is more of a geographical issue. Um, I mean, yes, yeah, you know, send a, send a kid to Starbucks, send a kid to McDonald's for the free Wi-Fi is just not a feasible thing, and many of them are not able to go to the library. So there's an, you know, the, the availability of Wi-Fi for the students that I had mentioned before is more of a, it's, it's an ongoing issue in terms of just access, and that is, that's a whole other conversation, but it, no, very good question there. This right here with Fullerton is, with the, with the areas that these students have, it's a higher population of students that have access to the technology, that have access to Wi-Fi. I don't have the exact numbers for Fullerton, but I do know that it is significantly higher in terms of access to a Wi-Fi access point at home or having at least some sort of technology in the house. So it definitely is, like I said, these are two different districts really working with. you have a problem with misuse. Uh, with what? Them using the the device on their network? Oh, so with- the risk there, I guess? Well, that's where, with the iPad, with the iPad for Fullerton, is logging into a portal through. Yeah, yeah that's where, so misuse is, yes, de yeah. misuse is definitely an issue, and that's where the, the filter comes in. It's like, okay, here's, your, here's our equipment, but you still have to fall under the same filters. So yes, it is, a, it is another level of protection for the students. So yes, very good question there. Um, also to add to, with Fullerton, 
there was a there's a push really that teachers need to be um, need to have the professional development they need. And there's a special division at Fullerton called TOSA, Teachers on Special Assignment. And they specifically go to schools and perform that professional development that the kids, I mean, that the teachers need to be able to implement the iPad, iPad integration properly in class. So there's also that. That's another addition to the district. And the primary, me the primary MDM for them is Lightspeed. It is a bit different. Um, but what it, one big key of it is that it allows teachers to choose apps that have been either purchased by the district, pre-approved by the district, and certain licenses allocated, and allow, them, allow the teachers to choose those applications and push them to select devices. So students are able to, depending on the classes they're in, so for example, a student who has um, art as an elective can get Photoshop Express, can get Spark Video, can get that. And a student who could be in honors English could be receiving other, other programs, or a person in math could be getting ST math for whatever reason. So that's, that's the other thing, too, that's really cool about having the mobile device management is that you're able to, to push out certain apps while other students, you know, whatever is, whatever is different they need for whatever class they have. So explaining the legal, ethical, copyright, privacy, securities, things like that that I see every day working with it. So issues to consider when you're, and you'll notice this when you are in, at the school sites, is the question is, has the, has the district fully committed or is it a partial committee, committal to technology integration? Um, it's forming a good technology support structure. It has to start at the top and it has, and it has to flow all the way to the bottom. So big things such as being able to um, get your support at the top level, making sure that mobile device management is not only structured at the school site, but it also goes throughout the entire district. And also making sure that policies are completely, um, I would say, aligned, and that there is active communication between multiple sites. And those are things that are super important. Because as mentioned before, you cannot just take a laptop and go, here's your laptop, have fun, we're not technology integrated. You can't do that. Because students have a certain skill set, being digital natives, being born into this, but they lack and need, must be taught the academics, the need, the the actual usage, the application, the ability to think within the within think outside and also within the apps that they are using. So it's there. There is another level of understanding that the, you're not born into. Sure, you know how to swipe. Sure, you know how to how to select how to go to a website. But once you're within all of that, how where where do those four C's come from? How do you form those skill sets to make those four C's happen? So. There's a lot of that. Knowing your students, age group, school culture, community, curiosity levels. You have the students who've never seen a keyboard before, and you have the students that were probably working on a laptop in the room. You don't know who you're gonna get. So really bridging that gap and figuring it out also does require you know, training teachers in how to do it, and also creating, creating programs and create, well, creating lessons and units that aren't just drill and kill. You know what I mean by drill and kill? It's like, here, here's your iPad. You're going to be doing multiplication for the next you know, 20 minutes. OK, you know, I don't know how many times you'll figure out what 7 times 9 is. But if you're saying, OK, I would like you to read this passage, and I need you to create a PowerPoint about this section of the document, and then I'll need you to use Google Docs to do this, and I will need you to annotate, and you're going to have one of your classmates go in and use suggestion mode to write their comments regarding your writing, there's a higher level of thinking there. So, and also what's considered as acceptable use. You know, we have mentioning the whole thing about privacy and violation and uh, violation of policies and potentially getting into websites that really aren't appropriate for school. And that's where like, sort of for example, the web filter portal through Take Home iPad. Um, web filters during school, tracking use and making sure that websites, flag, web, flag websites are identified and then modifying whitelist and blacklist as necessary. There's a lot going on there. And so there has to be an active dialogue between head of IT at the, at the highest levels of whatever or district organization you have and 
us, us technology assistants, IT professionals who are at the school sites seeing what's actually happening and going, okay, we need to adapt this. This, we've seen this work, we haven't seen, this, this part could be used some work and this isn't working at all. There has to be active dialogue at all levels. Otherwise, they just become playthings. They really do. And you will be, and you could end up with, with classrooms that use it because it's there and they have to because the district said so, rather than places that say, no, this is integral and we are, so into, we are so immersed in this that we could go paperless in five seconds right now. And I've seen classrooms that are capable of doing that. It's like, oh, paper's gone. Here, digital submission, go. And it, it has happened. And there are, there are many teachers who are being trained toward going in that direction. I mean, it's not gonna make paper obsolete, but it definitely reduces a lot of it. And the other thing, too, is that whole um, idea of how do these policies get put in place? Do we put web filters on everything and just say, nope, you can't touch this, nope, you can't touch that? Or do we see what happens and do we analyze the trends and say, okay, this is gonna be allowed, we'll allow things in this category, but that has to do with some category that we've, we haven't allowed yet, but we can whitelist that one site because that one class needs it. Adjustability. So once you've, once, once you've seen that, that, that the web filters can go from broad, and then you can nitpick what you need. And see, and that has actually been found to be a lot more effective, at least in the places that I have, I have served, so. Um, so the human portion of MDM. You know, there is a human portion of, of mobile device management. You have to commit to the constant usage of it. If you're going to use it to manage and keep track of your devices, it has to be constantly used. And so, dedicated professional development. So at Fullerton, it's TOSA. You know, having, having that. And in addition, always having a, a con, um, contact with the IT department. Having the ability to write a service ticket and go, I need help with this, I'm finding that this doesn't work. And then sending, sending someone out to be able to take care of it. Uh, curriculum co coaching, utilizing tech tools, it is not just a play thing. It is part of your, if you're part of your curriculum, you're gonna you know, it's going to be blended in, we're gonna find a way to do it and to, and to maximize its, its effectiveness as well. And also, as I mentioned, consistent IT support. We have 20 schools. There is a, an IAT um, dispatched to at least, uh, like one, every IAT has two schools. So I'm dispatched to two schools, and I also have the assistance of two dedicated technicians as well who come in certain parts of the week that cover and overlap. So I have constant overlapping coverage at Fullerton. And that has really huge because one of the sites that I'm at has over a thousand students in it. And when you have a thousand students having issues with their internet, either their home connections aren't working or, or uh, an app did not load properly or things like that, having, the, having that and having giant lines at times, depending on the time of the year, and especially during, uh, during CASP testing, yeah, that's, that's our favorite time of the year. We love CAT, no we don't. We don't love CASP testing. <laughs> So, um, also human part, creating the framework. What do you do after the student is uh, caught making poor choices? Is there a restorative action that they have to do? Is there a way that, that the MDM may have to be changed or adjusted because of what, what was seen? And in addition to, it's not a catch-all, you know? Can't just put monitoring devices that, okay, that's the second time that kids looked at that website, or, okay, well, let's go bust them immediately. There has to be an investigation involved. This happened to me a lot, especially when I was checking for site usage, and there was a, what is it? Um, I had a student who kept looking up uh, some uh, stuff about explosions in the Middle East. I'm like, okay, that's really weird. And I'm looking, I look at the student's name, I go into power school, I check the student's schedule, and I realize that the kid's in journalism. Okay, we're good, continue on. Or. Another kid's looking at Pokemon. Just lots of images about Pokemon. I look and the kid's in art. Okay, carry on. So there is a human aspect. You know, it, it cannot catch, it catches things, but then the human side goes, what, kid, what class is this kid in right now? So other things too. Uh, policies that have to be set. So any, any rules that are made in, a mobile device, in mobile device management software are called policies. And so what are they are customizable commands that they, they can allow or disallow things to happen. 
So for example, a uh, sixth grader cannot use a camera, cannot use, um, not allowed to use Siri, not allowed to do blah, blah, blah. Eighth grader, camera's allowed because there's a film class and Siri because they really haven't been caught with it, so why would we bother blocking it? And airdrop, and, and uh, airdrop may be allowed because this class needs it or whatever. So pol policies can be made in regards to that and also what they can see and what they can't. Uh, implementing them, it's all discretionary. Some, some policies will go too loose, sometimes they'll go too tight. It's all dependent on the school site. And also customizing well filters based on need, whitelist, blacklist. It's all, you know, webcam access, student email usage. The last site that I was at did not allow the usage of Gmail at all outside of, outside of um, the district, which, so basically anything with an alliance address is okay to email from teacher to student, student to student, and things like that. Of course, that's been debatable because students have decided to use it as a chat box and we haven't figured out how to get around that. So there's, there's always something. So. Okay, so admin, fil uh, so going back to, uh, yes, um, web filtering, there's your, there you go. YouTube actually has its own special for categories. So there's your blacklist, there's your whitelist. So what's allowed, and I had to have, so at, at one point teachers had to email me certain URLs, certain videos that they needed to see, and they had to do it the day before, otherwise we'd block at their lesson tomorrow. It happens. Now, differences, Fullerton is not as uh, locked about that for the most part. The filters at Fullerton are pretty low, except for anything that has been flagged to be 18 or over to look at. So yes, I, and it comes with its pros and cons. I, had, I caught a student watching a cartoon during PE when they were having their, their, um, their class because of how hot it's been in my media center. So, you know, there are pros and cons to that. But at the same time, you know, you're not getting bombarded with, hey, I need this video for my project, why is it blocked? So there is, you, you can't catch everything, but you can, you can manage it well enough. So device theft loss, it's one of my favorites. Asset management, physical inventory, making sure that all the iPads are alive and well, and, they're, and all the inventory is within multiple systems. So you have copies of the inventory in places that you can cross-reference by serial number and asset type, and always actively updating inventory. If I have to swap an iPad, and I'm talking about Fullerton right now, if I had to swap an iPad with a student, it would involve me having to check a device in and check it out like a library book, and then having to remove it from the mobile device management and then reissue, the, and then reissue a new iPad by registering that to the student. So there's, there's a multiple process in order to make sure that no student is caught with a iPad that doesn't belong to them. So every single one has a digital, has, has digital credentials on it. So every student has one. One of the fun ones is lost mode. Student comes up to me and goes, hey, my iPad's lost. So I put it in lost mode. Here's what it does. Renders it useless and starts incessantly dinging until I see a student walk in and say, I think this belongs to you. And it's really bad. Like, the, like think like the loudest, um, the, you know, the loudest ringtone that you've ever, you've ever heard on a phone. But incessantly and you can't turn it off until I click turn off lost mode. And it's also GPS tracked. So I could find out if it left the campus at all. Pretty cool stuff. Um, other, other options too, uh, physically locking Chromebooks. In the case of Fullerton, that's not, you know, all the iPads live in student backpacks. So really there's not much you can do there. But if you have a class card, or if you have a, a, um, an advisory card, then yes, at the end of the day, lock, lock, and go home. So. And uh, at my former site, um, school dismissal is held until everything is accounted for. I think the record currently for missing, Chrome, missing Chromebook was, I think, 35 minutes after school, and it was the day that I had taken off. I'm not even going to go there. <laughs> so tale of two districts, and uh, just wrapping this up, is thinking of the two districts that I have worked at, work at currently and the work I worked at previously, there are major differences in, in region, 
and there are major differences in demographics. One of the schools that, I, uh, that I'm at, uh, the, the one with 1,000 students at Fullerton, uh, has a more diverse population, so it, there's a lot, it's a mix of, of uh, Caucasians, African Americans, Asians, it's like a really mixed bag at that school. And another school that I teach at, I mean that I work at in, in Fullerton, is almost uh, 75 to 80% Hispanic. So there's a mixed bag right there. It's actually one side of Fullerton and the other side of Fullerton. So there is a difference there in terms of what students have seen in terms of technology and, and how the technology is taught. Of course, with the same goal of reaching those four C's, but also adjusting to what they've seen and what they haven't. Um, cultural, regional differences, you know, SES, social economic status, and also family exposure to technology. Going back to my former site, and realizing that students didn't have Wi-Fi, or they had to go to Starbucks, versus students at my, at my current district that would go, well, my, it's at home, I just log in and call it a day. There is, there is a gap there. And actually, you know, now one of the classes that I'm currently taking at the master's program, ETEC 525, which is uh, Digital Culture and Society, we spent an entire semester going through the, the consequences of the digital divide, as they call it, the differences between those who have and those who have limited access to. So there's, there's a huge discussion that I'm just even, I'm not even scraping the surface on. Um, District-wide policy systems and norms. If I had to consider a weakness from my previous site, it, it would easily have to be that most of the systems and policies were specific to my school only, and I had to create them myself. As in, when I left that district, or when I left that charter school organization, I left them with a 128-page manual on how to do the first four months of my position, and it was only then that those policies ended up being used at several other sites. So there is a weakness, that is probably the biggest weakness that I saw during my time at the charter school organization where they're still trying to figure it out versus a district that's been there before cars were. So. And also consistency and established structure and frequent turnover. That is something that turnover in a school will hurt every department. It will hurt every department. Stability and what you hope to achieve in a district you need to have it, you know. You know, my, my boss has been around uh, Fullerton School District for at least 20 years. I have, and, and it's, it's something that, you know, you'll see, you know, turnover and being able to trend, do proper transition, it is, it is definitely a big factor. So. You're talking about faculty and technical staff turnover? Or All of the above. Every student? Everything. Faculty, uh, IT department, no um, student dropout, though. Student dropout, I mean, that, you're going to get everywhere. Student drop. I mean, but I, I'm, so I'm, I'm huh? It's not so affecting as. No. In terms of, or, yeah, I mean, in terms of, in terms of technology in the classrooms, yeah. yeah, in terms of technology in the classrooms, yeah, faculty turnover, IT department turnover, um, central office turnover is going to hurt the most. I mean, when you're thinking about students, student success, I mean, Student dropout, that's ultimately going to hurt an individual rather than an entire district. That's, that's, that's kind of charter schools into the kind of Very much. General. And what I've just described here is the ongoing plight of the difference between a charter school and an established district. You're going to get it. I mean, if I had to, you know, put in perspective of things, you know, my departure a month ago made me the seventh person to leave in three months from my school site. And it was very painful. And this is not, I'm not the only school site that's done it. Whereas with Fullerton, and I'm talking to coworkers that, I, that are now my coworkers, and I have yet to find somebody who has been there less than five years. And by the time five years comes around, I think you've established a pretty good system that has been replicated multiple times. So yes, that, that is the ongoing plight, and that's a whole other conversation altogether, but there, there's that. And just to wrap up, like I said, just to throw it out there, FSD, 1888, and you have Alliance that is the largest charter school organization in Los Angeles. And they nearly have the same amount of students going from, uh, and, but the difference is Alliance is only uh, middle school and high school. Um, Fullerton is a younger population from K to eight. So there's a little bit of a shift there, which I don't have the time to really discuss, but there you go. <laughs> so parting thoughts, technology, it's always gonna change. 
and IT specialists, we have to stay on top of it. IT departments at districts have to stay on top of it. Solid structure from the, from the top to the bottom is important to the success of a district. You need it. Otherwise, there will be those issues in regards to safety, in, in regards to usage, in regards to learning, and, and just relevance and usefulness of the technology these students are gonna be walking away from when they graduate and leave their districts. So it's definitely important. And that yes, professional development, yes please. Need it, get it. Whatever you can get from a professional development involving technology, take it all in because it will help and improve any lesson plan that you choose to create. And also that school, uh, school pol policies, revise constantly. Revisit, not just as a reactive, but also as a preventative, you know? If you have a, a slew of students that are looking at really odd websites, you know, that's not the only time that you have to react to something. Also thinking about, hey, we're about to, we're, how are the, we're about to get new um, devices. How are these policies going to protect these devices and also protect the students that are using them? It's, it's a constant, it's, it's, a both a, it's both a reactive and a preventative. And when you have both of those balanced, it really does increase the effectiveness of having the technology there. And of course, at the front lines, you know, mm -hmm. us IT people, <laughs> it's, it is, it's an ongoing battle that never ends. We're always going to be dealing with something, so. And that concludes my presentation. If you have any questions, <laughs> my email there, and please feel free to uh, um, you know, chime in if you have any other questions or anything like that.